There we go. Sorry I was a little bit late into session hour. We had supper a little bit late tonight, so it's like I'm trying to eat really fast. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so in terms of if you're finding that in your pre-test that you are doing things that may be new or may be at a higher level, I, um, I suggest sometimes to go back to the textbook and just look at some of the checkpoint questions and added questions because that sometimes is a good sort of um, uh, bridge between the, the My Math Lab homework um, and the textbook. So sometimes going back helps. Um, but that's just that's just a, a suggestion if you have if you haven't looked at the textbook I always recommend that at some point to go back and and have a look some students start off with the textbooks and sometime and some students um, go back after they've done the my math lab so it's really whatever is best for the student but to to visit the textbook at some point is really my my biggest recommendation. Um, but you say you have questions. Do you, you want to? Are they from the pretest? Well, yeah. There's one there sure. that I'm spending hours researching and trying to come to terms with how it actually works because yeah, I, I'm sure it's a very simple answer. But you know, the simple answer is not always easy to get when That's you're looking right. it up on the net. Yes, exactly. So if what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the pretest, and if you can tell me um, what number on the pretest, what question number, I'll, I can bring it up on the whiteboard. It says number nine. Okay. Let me just. Give one pretest. Okay. Let's see. Uh, da -da. Okay, unit one pretest preview. And did you say number eight? No, number nine. Oh, number nine. Okay. Actually, no, go back to number eight. Go I back. kind of uh, guessed on number eight. I'm not sure if that'll be right or not, but yeah, I can't I can't go back to number eight, but I do know that I was having a problem with it. And okay. then um, going to number nine, obviously I can't go any further. Okay. Oh, and I'm in the wrong view because it won't let me go forward. Just a sec. I'll leave. Preview. <laughs> no, I guess I have to go into preview. Oh, it's being silly. Um, yes. Oh, that is so weird. Okay, I'm going to have to go in through a different way. Sorry, that's usually I can navigate inside a pretest, but it's not letting me. Um, I'll go in the other way. Uh, edit. Okay, number eight. Duke. Okay, I'm going to print this screen, Duke, and bring it into paint. I'll be faster on the next questions, I promise, now that I have it, have it working okay. properly. Okay. And then, 
It's just taking a second to paste this in for us. Come on, you. There we go. Is this the one? Oh, it's, um, it's probably going to take a second to get up onto yours. Okay. Is it up? Yeah, it's okay. very tiny. It's tiny on yours. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Select Ooh. all. Hmm. Doesn't want to make it bigger for some reason. Try again. There we go. Woo! So that's probably as big as I can make it. If you go, hmm, speaker view. If you go up to the top right of your of your screen, there is a mm -hmm. there's a full screen mode. There's like arrows and the top yes. of the blue. If you click on that, that might make it a little bit bigger for you. Yeah, it is. The screen is bigger, but the printing of the letter of uh, the numbers are very tiny. Are very 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 tiny. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. It will go out of the screen, but maybe it'll be a little bit there. How about that? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Great. I'll just make it super big so it fills up the screen. Um, so, express the interval in set builder notation and graph the interval on a number line. So, we're looking at... So this is um, just uh, interval notation, and set builder notation is when they want you to um, to put x and say that uh, x is going to be a number within the set, and then you're putting limitations on that set. So set builder notation is um, is when you have those curly brackets. You always have to have the curly brackets on either side. You always have to have a variable, which they normally say is x, and then the line, the straight line, means x is a member of, and then you write down your interval, and your interval you're going to use the inequality symbols, so either uh, less than, greater than, or less than and equal to, or greater than and equal to. So knowing the knowing what the set builder notation has to have is always the first sort of um, first thing you need to know. So always have these squiggly parentheses. You're always going to have your variable. You're always going to have this straight line to say that X is a member of the, the set and the set always contains your, your, your inequality symbols. So looking at that, um, now this is from yours, so you did get this right. Oh my gosh, I wasn't sure because um, one thing I noticed though, uh, the squeak, the parentheses, you know, the curly brackets yeah. there. Yes. That's not an option on your uh, on their uh, answer sheet. You know where you have all the the signs uh, symbols there for math. Oh, so you mean <laughs> when you're when you're doing your my math lab, you're having trouble finding those curly parentheses? I just didn't see any, and I'm not sure when I have to use them. But you just said that it, when it says a solution set. Yes. Yep. Yep. So when you when you're doing this um, set builder notation, you're going to use those squiggly parentheses, and they're actually on your keyboard. So if you look on your keyboard, you have round brackets, you have square brackets, and usually oh, this yeah the squiggly parentheses are with your square brackets. So that's where you find that. That, that's on our keyboard on our uh, yeah computer. okay yep, that's on your keyboard and this and and this line this straight whoop, 
The straight line is also on your keyboard. Now, depending on your keyboard, it could be in different places. Mine's around my enter key, and it's got a, it's got a, a backward slash, but sometimes a computer will have just the, just the, the, the straight line itself. Hmm. Yeah, mine is like a, a symbol that it's, you know, like kind of like, yeah, mine, I don't have that. <laughs> okay, so I'm thinking though on the, if I bring up, just a sec, I'm going to go to question nine. Nope, 10 maybe? Nope. Sometimes it will show up in the, like, as a toolbar at the bottom, you can put in the symbols. Okay. Did you see, it, did you see a tool, toolbar when you brought up your pretest on the bottom? Just wondering. You mean the toolbar that contains all the, um, like, the symbol for math? Yeah, the math symbols. Yeah, I've been through it, but I can't find those parentheses, and nor can I find that um, that That's straight line straight. that goes right after the X. Okay, I'm going to see if I can. I'll take a look after our session, Clara, and I'll, I'll write you back to where to find those. But you should okay. have that bar. We found the print the squiggly parentheses on your on your keyboard but you should yeah. also have that bar so you kind of have to look around for it, it well, could... I just noticed I'm sorry the I just noticed the bar oh but good it's right to keep the number one because there's like a number sign and then there's a straight red line so I'm assuming that's the bar that might be the bar yeah so it's in a different place. I find that different computers will have them in, in different places so you might have to shift and then your number one to get that bar. Um, but I'll also check my math lab. I'll, I'll go into the pretest myself as a as a student and see if I can find it in that math palette. Sometimes if you hit more, it will give you more options. But, oh, okay. Yeah, but I think you can. But since you have it on your keyboard, you should be able to to do that. Okay, now. Okay. Okay, and then then you're then the the next part. Whoops. Let me bring it. There we go. And then the next part of uh, set builder notation is always going to be where you express um, where x falls. So we have x is going to be less than negative 8. So here we, ha and but not equal to. So because it's not equal to negative 8, you have to put a round bracket. A round bracket means that um, that eight isn't included in the set. The only way it would be included in the set is if there was a square bracket right here or if it this was x is less than and equal to negative eight and then you would have a square bracket but that's not what it was showing in the uh, interval notation. It didn't have the square bracket, it had the round bracket, which means that you're not going to include 8 and you're going to go to negative infinity and that's why there's a there's an arrow here for that one. Um, okay. But, but it sounds so like for you... The question I have is... Yes, go ahead. So, Okay, that's that's easy to comprehend. Negative infinity to negative eight, because it's saying x is obviously going to be infinity or whatever it's going, the number is going to be. Is that what the x represents? Yeah, the x is saying that x can be any number between negative infinity and negative eight. Okay. So I got that, but on to the next question, yes. number nine. Yes. Okay. Let me just clear this so I have room to put a new one. And then X out of there. And then I'm going to go into number nine. There we go, I'll resize it here. <clears throat> and then there we 
go. So use graphs to find the set. Select the correct choice below and oh okay so we have interval notation and not set builder notation and we have two sets that it's showing here. It says our first set is negative 5 and negative 4 but not including because of, it's got the round brackets and we're saying the intersection that's what the upside down U stands for so we're intersecting the first set with the second set and the second set is negative 3 to positive 6 but we're including both negative 3 and positive 6 so when you do this where you're, where you're having to use graphs you want to draw both sets on a number line like that okay. and it looks like the farthest I go down is negative 5 and the furthest I go up is positive 6 so 5 4 3 2 1 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 so that's 4 3 whoop. Oh, I messed up. There's seven. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. And these are all negatives. So the first thing you want to do is just graph your first set. So our first set is uh, negative five to positive four, but it's round brackets because we're not going to include the negative five and we're not going to include the positive four. So it's going to be round brackets for that. And I'm just going to use my highlighter and my X is going to be anything in between there but not including negative 5 and positive 4. Are you okay with that Clara? Yeah I understand. Okay. So X is, okay go ahead. Yep so then I'm going to go and go ahead and graph this second set. Now the second set is um, maybe I'll choose a different color here. Uh, negative 3 but we're including negative 3 this time and positive 6. So that's going to be that set there. And then, whoop. so that's X is going to be everything in between there to there for that set. So when we're looking at the intersection point, we're looking at where the two sets overlap. And can you see where the two sets overlap? We're looking at from negative 3 to positive 4, correct? Yes, that's, that's what I see, yeah. Yep, yeah, great. So when you write your interval notation for that, you know that the smallest number is going to be negative 3, the largest number is going to be 4, so x is going to fall somewhere between those, but we need to know do we include negative 3 or do we exclude it? And how you know is by looking at what the bracket is on negative 3, and you can see that our bracket is a square bracket. It's this one because of this right here. So that's how you decide whether to include the negative 3 or not by looking at what type of bracket did you draw on your graph. So you have to be really careful when you're drawing your graph that you're using the brackets that are shown in your sets. And if you use the brackets that are shown in your sets correctly, then when you go to write your solution, you're going to have the, the, the proper brackets. So it's a square bracket on the negative 3 and when we look at positive 4 we have a round bracket so we're just going to add a round bracket and then that is our solution set for the intersection of the set negative 5 to negative 4 and negative 3 to positive 6. Okay so when it asks you to express the interval Yes. I believe that was a question. Yep, this is the this um, is the this is the interval. That's interval notation. If they wanted me to write it in set builder notation, set builder is where I have to express it as x is a member of and then I have to say that x falls between negative 3 and positive 4, but including negative 3. So I would go negative 3 x is going to be greater than and equal to negative 3, but uh, less than positive 4. So both solutions are correct. It's just that this is interval notation 
and this is okay. set builder notation. Okay, so um, I guess I'm just going to throw this one out to you so yeah. I try to understand it. It says it's negative 7 and 4, which is uh, both um, including brackets, I guess. The Square brackets? No, the no, not including the... Uh, not including. Okay, the, so, yep, not including. So the excluding ones and the round brackets. And then the um, intersection. Intersection. Sign, the symbol. And then it's the closed brackets, negative three, or oh, no, zero and eight. Zero and eight. And are these the square brackets on this one or the round brackets? Yes, square brackets. Square brackets. So does it look like that? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to draw my line here. And six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Doesn't like me writing small four, negative five, negative six, and negative seven. So again, it's intersection. So I'm looking at where the two sets overlap. And the first thing I want to do is just graph the first set. So I'm going to graph the first set in purple. So I have negative seven, and it's saying that I have a round bracket on negative seven. So I'm going to put a round bracket on negative seven. And I'm going to positive 4. So positive 4 is here. And again, I'm making sure that I use the exact same bracket that is in my interval. So I have another round bracket. So that's going to be my first graph. Um, and x is going to be in, included between negative 7 and positive 4, but it's not going to include negative 7 or positive 4. And then the second set is this 0 and 8, where both 0 and 8 are included. So square bracket for 0 and a square bracket for 8. So that's going to be from there to there. So what I'm looking for is where they uh, intersect. And I can see that the intersection is going to be right here. Like that. Oh. Sorry. OK. And then, so I'm looking at that, what would you say then would be the solution set for that, where the two sets intersect? Well, it would be a zero and yeah. um, four, but the brackets around a zero is um, including, or is closed? Yeah, so that's including, yeah. Yeah, and the other one will be not including. Right, so it's square bracket, zero, and then the four round bracket. Okay. And that's and and that's the inter that's the solution interval for that. And then if I were to write it in set builder, then it's going to be x is a member of the following set. So x is going to be gr uh, greater than zero. and equal to zero. Okay. And it's going to be less than four, but not okay. equal to four because of this round bracket means that it's not equal to four. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you wanted more practice on this, so if you did a little bit in my math lab and it wasn't enough, have you used the study plan yet in my math lab? Have you seen that? What do you mean? Is it it's all videos? Well, no. It's so in. If you go into my math lab and you get the full, um, you 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 choose the second option that says uh, my math lab with e textbook. That gives you the full course, so you'll see on the left-hand side a menu. It has your grade book, it has your homework, it has your test. Have you seen that before? Okay, just one second. Let me go back to yeah. the beginning. Right. I might be able to share my, I might be able to present my desktop too so I can show you. Yeah, my computer is very slow and I'm not happy because I hope it don't, you know, um, screw up my uh, math test when I do it online. Yes, yes. If you find that you're you you're having problem if 
problems that way. Did you do you find that your computer is turning off when you're doing the pretest or your homework? Uh, I just find that the connection is really bad because it keeps. It's almost like you know. You remember the old dial to, dial up um, connections? Yes. It would sit there and wait and wait and wait until it actually does something. Well, that's what's happening to my oh, computer. Okay. So it seems like it's taking a long time to get through different yeah. questions. Okay. If yeah. that happens for um, a test, you might have to go on somebody else's computer or maybe do it from if you have a library like where where do you live Clara Hammond's Plains oh good okay Hammond's Plains if you um that's near me <laughs> I'm out in St. Margaret's Bay so um Tantalon Library has uh um computers that you can use and you can mm -hmm. definitely go there and do your and do your take at home tests from that um um from that library and uh, and and you might even be able to book a quiet room um, to do it in as well. So just just as a backup, if you're finding that your computer is not all that trustworthy, um, a public library is a great place to go and, and write. You could also go into campus too and do it at the library on campus. Like the the IT campus is a really nice has a really nice library and computers that you can use as well. And then you would know for sure that you wouldn't have any problems. But try the first test at home, and if things go um, screwy, just let me know, and we'll we'll we can I can give you um, we'll we'll reset it so that you can do it. But um, but if it works okay. well, then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So you were saying something about the study plan? Yeah. So can you see my desktop now? Oh, hold on. Let me bring it up. Yeah. So I'm in Skype and I'm just sharing my desktop so you can see how I go in. Oh, you got to go underneath the Pearson? Because like, I've been just using the videos and the homework stuff that is presented there on the uh, under uh, yes. content. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually in Pearson. So I've just clicked on Pearson My Lab and Mastering. And then mm -hmm. and now I'm going to go and click on this second student link, My Math Lab and Pearson eTex Course Home. This is the link that I recommend that everybody goes into to get into the Pearson uh, program course site because it gives all of the options. And I'll show you what I mean as soon as it comes up. So here's our course, and, and be, when you select that second link, you get all of this stuff on the left. Do you see course home, homework, quizzes yeah. and tests? So you'll, you'll access your homework through the homework button, mm -hmm. and your quizzes and tests through this button. Mm -hmm. Your grade book, when you click on that, it will give you all of your grades, and that's where you can go back and review your pretest and review your test. Um, chapter contents is your e-textbook, so you can click on that to go into chapter P in your in your textbook. But the study plan, whoop, I gotta go back one main menu. The study plan is this um, intuitive um, program that looks at what questions you got wrong on your homework, and it will give okay. you extra questions based on ones that you need more help in. So then you can just click on practice or quiz me and this doesn't have anything to do with marks so it's just on it's just for your own thing. Um, but you can go in there and as you as you move along in your homework it's going to add things to this study plan that's just for you that would just be extra practice um, and uh, and you don't have to worry about your marks going through this this is just for extra help and it's not going to show up on on your marks but it's nice because it changes as you get as as you it knows what you're good at and it knows that what you're weak at and it will only give you extra stuff for what you're weak at Okay, so you that'd can, be great. Yeah, so that's that's just an extra thing that 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 you can use. So it might already have some of these interval questions for you because it it it, it will have followed you through your homework. But try that out. And okay. you can, and you can also in your textbook as you're following along, there's there's exercises at at the end of each section, and the answers are at the back of the textbook. So there's some extra practice there as well, um, if you need it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's, wonderful. Yeah. So I just go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I uh I was, I finished that unit 
uh, unit one, but section four. P four. Yeah. So that on. Was the hardest, that was the hardest section for me. Yeah, and do you know what? That's that's completely normal. Everybody is going to find that P four, that radicals and rational expressions, are going to is going to be the most difficult section, and that's because that's probably fairly new. Like P point um, P point one, the interval note the the number theory not so bad the interval notation that always takes a little bit of practice to come back and then p2 is the algebra but most people have already refreshed that in the refresher so they're okay with that scientific notation and exponents which is p.3 um, not so bad once you get the rules so that's not so bad but most definitely p.4 is the is the section that's going to need the most practice because we don't use um, square roots every day and it's a lot of simplification so the more practice you can get with simplifying the radical expressions um, the better you will be at it but don't feed that's everybody is going to be in the same boat with that and my um, recommendation is that as you're going through if you get stuck send me an email with your question or your there's that instructor but um, ask my instructor tool in my math yeah. lab you can hit that that's a great way for me to see something or you can just send me an email or put it in a, a Q&A um, but make sure you ask the question you get them answered before you do the test um, and you have two attempts at the pretest so if you're finding you're getting stuck on a pretest um, attempt you can always ask me questions about it and then go back and do your second attempt so don't feel that you can't ask me questions from the pretest like we even did pretest questions um, tonight which is great I think that that's um, uh, there's no problem in asking me pretest questions okay okay yeah so that's then that's the area where I'm at and I don't know what's in the pretest until I get there because I was stuck on this one particular thing like for like two hours trying to research and trying to find out uh, is this going to be what sh because you were sorry because I wasn't sure there was no symbols there for the you know the um Oh, nice yes, and that would get you stuck for sure. Yeah. And in that case, Clara, you can you can always email me and say, like, if I always say, if you're getting stuck on something for more than a half an hour, mm -hmm. email me. Okay. <laughs> yep, don't, don't sit any more than a half an hour with something. Email me or text me. Um, my phone number is on... Um, is in the welcome unit and also on all my emails my phone number is there so please feel free to to use that as well um, but I think you have that now, done now so that's good you know where those symbols are they're either on your keyboard and it might also be in that tool palette at the bottom okay did you want me to go over anything in terms of p.4 no simplifying? It, the thing with p4 is that I have to practice, practice, practice with it. Yes. Because that's the only way to understand all the steps. Because I know there's like ten parts to the, to that, um, to the solution, I guess. And then it, it can be crazy, depending on the, um, I guess the um, question that it has with the exponents. The yes. Um, I have to remember the steps. Yeah, and you're right. You said there are ten. There there are ten different outcomes for that. If you're working through the through the book, so you're you want to make sure you do number one and then have practice with that and make sure you're okay with that and then go to number two and 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 see what that new example is and and work through the more practice problems you work with, for sure the better. What I will say is that. Claire, let's say you get to the test and you're doing the test and you're doing some of these um, radical or rational questions and you you have the right answer but you don't simplify all the way to the end. You can kind of see how you're doing that. Like you, you probably have done it in the My Math Lab already where you had it all you had the right answer, but they're like, Oh, you didn't simplify it down completely. Like for instance, um, yes. that is so frustrating. Yes. Yeah, I'm just Will our test be composed of something like that? Because, I mean, it's like, are we going to lose marks? <laughs> well, that's that's what I'm going to say. So let's say, like, you got something like this, where it was 5 square root of 20, and you got that as your answer. Well, that's the correct answer, but you can reduce this square root of 20 mm -hmm. into simpler terms. Now, it's not a perfect square. There's nothing that you can multiply by itself to get 20, 
but what you can do is say, okay, 20 is uh, four, what? Four, four times five. five, yeah, which is the same as five, five two. Square, oh, yep, you're you, you're one step ahead of me, but it would be this, yes. and then this can be um, reduced to two, simplified to a two square root five. So the actual reduced answer is going to be five times two is ten square root five. So let's say you get to the, the test and, and you do your, your operation and you get this, but you don't reduce it to this. The computer is going to mark it as zero, but I would mark it as at least a 0.5 if not a 0.75. So what I want everyone to do after their test is to go back in through the gradebook in my math lab, open up mm -hmm. their test, review the answers that they got wrong, and then send me an email that says, Lori, can you have a look at these questions? And I will most definitely go in and look at those questions. And I've had students that bring their mark up by 15% because I've gone in and saw that they had the right answer. They just didn't reduce it down to the most simplest form and I was able to give marks. And I think that's a great I think that's great that students go back in and check their tests anyway, um, and it's. Uh, I hope it's an incentive because you will be rewarded with extra marks, hopefully, and it's good just to see like where you went right and where you went wrong and where you need to to do a little bit more. But I guess the short answer is Clara that yes, on the test by all means go back in after you've done it look for areas that I can give you extra marks because that's what I'm here for I'm the human <laughs> and my math lab can be very very strict it's the it's the one downside uh, one of the major downsides of my math lab is that it is very strict in how it gives points um, but on the other hand it's just nice to have in order to use it for the the homework it's nice to have that feedback but um, but just after your test go back in and anything like this where you have the right answer but you didn't quite get it down to that final form just let me know and then I'll go in and give you the extra marks okay great okay <laughs> and that's for every test so and, and I would even if the computer wasn't strict and gave you half marks it's just good practice to go and see you know here's my test how did I do where did I go wrong um, is there anything that I can do better on or is there any points that were were missed I think students would do that even if it was a human that was marking the test they would want to go in and make sure that you know your teacher didn't miss anything so um, so I want to make sure that everybody does that for for this too. And some people don't, and that's fine. They're happy with the mark that they get. But if you can take the extra ten minutes to go over your test, um, it could mean um, quite a f few extra marks for you for sure. Okay. Okay. But that's yeah. a good that's a good one where it's like, okay, I have my answer. It looks like it's it could be right. Um, but students always forget to make sure that they that they have that number underneath the um, the radical sign in its most reduced form, and that takes a little bit of added practice. Now, for these take-at-home tests, you have your textbook, you have your notes, um, so you you don't have to memorize all the rules. You should have your your study notes with you for the test. So you, so. Um, so that should be a little bit of a of a safety net. The only thing that we ask is that students don't use the internet or their smartphones during the take at home test and hope you know just as a as an integrity kind of a thing, but you're okay. most definitely allowed to use your study notes and you're definitely allowed to use um, your textbook. Okay, and I've been writing notes. Perfect. I uh, there was one question there. I, I just thought of it because I just saw it on my yeah. paper because I was working on it. It's about the uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I looked at that, I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at <laughs> because yeah. after looking at all the quadratic equations in that and the rational, you know, uh, with the exponents, I didn't know what I was doing honestly, and I had to go look it up and say, "What am I doing here?" Because oh, is that is that a question in in my math lab about Fahrenheit to Celsius? That's in the uh, pretest. Oh, it was in the pretest. Ooh, that might just be uh, that might 
that sounds like something about using formulas. Yeah. Hmm. Does it give you the formula to use? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. That might be then how to rearrange. Um, that might be uh, an application question under algebra and how to rearrange formulas. Do you have the, can you tell me what the, oh, and you, did you say that was in the pretest? Yeah, it was. Okay, I'll bring that up and then, uh, let's see. Where... Question number two or three. Oh, cool. Okay, question number two. Oh, yes. Okay. There it is. Let me just write it down. Like you said, it's a formula, so I looked at it. I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. Yes. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to write it down so I can put it on the whiteboard. Oh, minus 32. It might help if I write it down right. So Celsius equals 5 ninths of the Fahrenheit minus 32. Use the formula to convert 95 degrees Fahrenheit to the equivalent temperature on the Celsius scale. So we're looking for what the Celsius is going to be. Okay. Awesome. Because, I, honestly, I didn't know you had to go T in brackets, Celsius equals T Fahrenheit, T multiplied by Fahrenheit minus 32 in brackets, multiplied by 5 nine. Five nines. Oh, but they gave you the formula, so you don't have to memorize the formula. They're just saying, here's a formula. Can you, if we say, if we give you the data, can you solve for the unknown variable? So that's a, an application question for, for algebra. Um, but you wouldn't have to memorize, you don't have to memorize any formulas um, like Celsius Fahrenheit conversions or I don't know, um, circumference of a circle. They'll always give you the formula that they want you to figure out one of the unknown variables for. Okay. So in this one they gave you, they're saying, okay, we're going to give you this formula, which is Celsius is equal to 5 ninths the Fahrenheit minus 32. And they're yeah. saying, okay, if the Fahrenheit temperature in Fahrenheit, so our temperature is equal to... 95 degrees Fahrenheit, what will be the temperature in Celsius? So what they want us to do is using the formula figure out what degrees Celsius is going to be given the Fahrenheit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this equation 5 ninths and for Fahrenheit I'm going to put in 95 degrees mm -hmm. minus 32 like that and then I'm going to solve and I, I'm going to use um, order of operations which means I'm going to do inside the brackets first so 95 minus 32 is equal to 63 and then I'm going to multiply that by 5 ninths and you can do that a couple of different ways on your calculator you could find the decimal equivalent of 5 ninths first, which would just be 5 divided by 9, and it's 0 0.555 repeating. Or you could multiply 63 by 5 and then divide the whole thing by 9. That would also give you the same answer. Yeah, that's how I, I did that. So yeah. the uh, decimal thing on the, com on the calculator, I don't know that yet. <laughs> the the decimal? I'm sorry? No, no, you don't understand the decimal on your? Um, like, no, no, no. Convert it from fraction to uh, a decimal on the calculator. Oh, oh, okay. So all you have to do for that is any fraction that you're given, doesn't matter what it is, think of that line as being division. So for five nines, it's five divided by nine, and that will always give you the decimal equivalent for your fractions. Oh, okay, I understand. Yeah, but the way you did it too, which is multiplying 63 by five and getting that answer and then dividing it all by nine is another way to also multiply by five nines, so that works too. And then, yeah, that's easier for me. <laughs> yeah, and then that gave you 35 degrees Celsius, so that, that you just use that formula 
given what your Fahrenheit is to find your Celsius. That's all it's asking you to do. Okay. Yeah, and it's not asking you to memorize that. It's just saying, let's see if I give you a formula, if you can figure out the unknown um, if I give you one of the data pieces. So it just it's just it's just testing to make sure that no matter what type of formula they give you, that you're able to put in the data and find whatever they're looking for. All right. Yeah. I got it. It's just that I was thrown for a loop there because I was so caught up in doing the uh, the last, like, piece of work. Yes. Sort of thing. And my brain was not... Sometimes I find it very difficult to read other stuff. Yes. <laughs> and that one did does seem if you it seems like it's out of the out of the norm. It's like, whoa, where did this formula come from? And are we having to um, change Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius? But that's really not the purpose of this. It was more of just can you use formulas and rearrange like algebraically, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Got it. You I did great. If you're already on P4, I mean, I know that the, the test is that the deadline for this unit is Friday. So everybody should be completing their tests by midnight on Friday. But if you've already, if you're already into P4 and it's Tuesday night, then that's great because that means you have Wednesday and Thursday um, to just polish up some things and you can try your study, go that study plan in my math lab. That will give you some extra practice as well. But it sounds to me like you're well on your way in this unit. You're right where you should be. Okay. That sounds good. Yes. <laughs> that positive for math. Yes. <laughs> and then the last thing I'll say is that, so, you know, all of all of the students in, in NSCC are, are um, adult students. You know, some people have full-time jobs, part-time jobs, families, and all of that. Right now, any student that's watching this, um, you're looking at your having to do your test by Friday. And if you're looking at Friday going, oh my goodness, I've got to do a 12 hour shift. You know, my kids got, uh, you know, a, a something on Thursday afternoon and it's going to be a really tight fit to get my test done by Friday. You can email me and request an extension and extensions can be um, one to two days so that would be for the weekend to have um, the test done by Sunday afternoon and all I request from students is that they email me 24 hour in, hours in advance so that would be Thursday evening at the latest and to request an extension and and you know let me know that you know just it's been a busy week and um, and hopefully you know like Claire, if you were to ask for that, I would go in and I would see all the work that you've been doing in my math lab. I'd be like, you know what? She's been working away and she's having a busy week and two extra days is fine. And then I'll say, yep, just take the two extra days and then I go in and extend it in my math lab. So feel free to to do that as we're going along in the course. And if you feel that you could use an extra two days just to practice up, um, then all it takes is an email 24 hours in advance. Okay. Okay? Yeah, got it. Awesome. <laughs> and thank you. These questions are great. Well, yeah, I'm this is taking this is preoccupying my brain for the entire summer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yay, math. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could say it gets easier, but it's it's the Math 1046 and Math 1047 are probably our hardest online access courses. Um, I think physics and math are probably the hardest. I know bio is a lot of reading and a lot of memorizing terms and processes, but the math, it just takes, like, you can't just read it and write down a definition. You really have to practice and practice and practice. So it's a tough course, but man, when students yeah. are done, it's, you know, you feel like you've really done something. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I feel for you. At least there'll be nice weather. You can maybe, you know, with sunglasses, go outside and practice. Oh, no. No. I, I got it. My head's going to be in this completely, um, like, concentrating on what's in front of me. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, if, do you have any other questions for me, Clara? No, none right now, but okay. I'm sure when I come up with it, I'll send you a, a message. Yes, please do. Use That's what I'm here for, and the, and the more questions, the better. And 
and I can either do a solution for you out on paper or if it's one that I think needs a little bit more you know talk I'll just do a quick video and send you the link sure okay that sounds great okay yes. great well if you're if you're good I'm going to close up shop and process this video because I'm sure you know there's going to be students that will want to see what we talked about um, but I'm in until 830 so if you if you think of a question and want to pop back in I'll be here okay okay good luck Clara Thank you, Lori. you're Thank welcome you. thanks for coming out okay, okay. Bye. bye